Awesome to be with you guys. It's a great story, isn't it? It's just been so awesome as we've been here in these times together and the story of Jesus, the centrality of the beauty of Jesus right there in the center of the story is that gift that he gives to uphold our hearts and to carry us. He's so awesome. He's so awesome. We are going to be talking in this session. I feel like we've, you know, we've had these, these declarations and these, these glorious testimonies and witnesses of, of who he is and of even the, the great story and, and where it's going and the urgency of the hour. And what my heart is in this session is that we would drill down a little bit and go, okay, how then shall we live, oh God? How then shall we live? And the bridegroom fast, these two themes that almost seem, on, they seem contradictory. You know, it's the fellowship with the bridegroom, the one who loved us and washed us from our sins, the one who gave himself for us and loves us with an everlasting love. Then together with this idea and this concept of fasting, and we go, do those two even go together? But the Lord Jesus brought them together. And we're gonna be looking at Matthew 9 in, in just a few moments, and when Jesus brought these two themes together, he knew what he was doing. But I wanna just highlight for a moment, just again, my heart in this session is to bring our hearts, just that posture of how do I live, God, because I know, if you're like me, you're in this room going, God, give me a burning heart. Give me a burning heart. And I feel the urgency, I see the need of the hour, I, I see the storm on the horizon, God, and I wanna have eyes to see it more, but God, give me a heart that burns for the, for the man Christ Jesus. And I, I see the Lord on the other side of that prayer with eyes wide going, I will. Give me yourself. Give me your time. Let's do this thing because it's my heart to bring you into that place that I prophesied. They will love me with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. It's real, it's possible to love the God-man Christ Jesus with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And Jesus is there on the other side of that prayer going, it's what I do to bring about burning hearts all over the earth. And as we know, he's going to do just that. He will cause hearts of the body of Christ, of the bride of Christ, all over the earth and all throughout the nations to become so overcome, so wrapped up with their, all of their passions centered on that person and that man who is the Lord himself, and he will return to a bride made ready. So it's what he loves to do, to cause our hearts to burn. We're going to look at the gift of fasting. I wanna look at three things. First, the gift of fasting. Then the heart of fasting. And then lastly, the fight in fasting. I wanna look first at, at just, again, paradoxical words, fasting and gift. Because, you know, most of us hear the word fasting and we go, I think I'll go to the other session. You know, like, I mean, we hear the fasting thing and we go, oh yeah, 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 that's, yeah, I, yeah, that, I, gotta, I gotta do that, right? We don't love fasting, nobody loves fasting. I believe that fasting is a true gift, and I'll tell you why. Because God set up his kingdom in such a way that it's to the hungry that he comes. Only the hungry get Jesus. Only the thirsty get Jesus. If you're not hungry, guess what? You don't get him. And I just picture Jesus, I picture him, you know, on the Sermon on the Mount. There he was, the word made flesh. He's been around a while. In fact, 
he was way back, you know, way back. The Word who was with God and was God. He was in the beginning. He was God. And through him, all things were made. And, you know, fast forward, here he is. And he's speaking eye to eye, face to face with his people. He knew just exactly what he was talking about. When he talked about the lifestyle of the Sermon on the Mount, prayer and fasting and giving, forgiving our enemies and all these things, that man knew what he was talking about. I mean, I just imagine him, you know, remembering back to when he and the Father, the Spirit fashioned humanity, carved out that space in the interior life of man and said, that is for God. Only God can fill that space. God alone will answer the cry of the human heart. I alone will satisfy. I alone will be the quenching to that thirst. And so it was that person, it was the Lord, who's looking at the people eye to eye in the Sermon on the Mount, and he goes, okay, it's prayer, it's fasting, it's giving, it's forgiving your enemies. And he gives us these practical aspects of living. And we have got to take him seriously. He knows what he's talking about. He knows that we were made for him. He put that, he put eternity in our hearts. And there's that cry in us that every other thing never satisfies but oh. When we touch the living, potent reality of God himself, that ache is answered. In fact, one taste of that man, and it ruins us. We go, I'd go the rest of my days just by that one taste. It's real. It's real. He satisfies. And he made us for himself. Here's the problem. Though we're made for God, we stifle that ache with a thousand other things, day in and day out. We don't even know we're doing it, but we, we stifle that God-given thirsting that was that, that, that aching and groaning that was meant to be directed straight to him and answered in him. And we fill ourselves with so many lesser things and they, they dull our inner man. So God gives us this gift. It's a gift. It's called fasting. Fasting is like this escort to that grace of hunger. Do you know what it is to hunger for God? To hunger for God and do you know what is happening in your heart when you find yourself hungry for the Lord? I remember so clearly when it connected to me. Hunger is from God. I, I, I found myself so many times thinking, man, Lord, I'm so hungry for you and you never come. You just never answer and here I am just so, you know, holy in my hunger. And it was the light, like the Lord leaned down and he's like, where do you think that came from? Do you think you made that up? Do you think you like conjured up that thing? Do you think you did that? And I'm like, well, I'm, I mean, not technically. He's like, that's right. Every good and perfect gift, it's from me. I gave you that, and guess what? Hunger is not a sign of my absence. It's proof of my presence. If you find yourself hungering for the Lord, I mean, it, God has shown up. He's already in your midst. There is a working in the inner man by the Spirit of God that causes our hearts to yearn for him. He is committed to taking that hunger all the way to love sickness where you yearn for nothing else. Say yes to that hunger. It's of God. Fasting, it, it's like it gets up right underneath that hunger and it just makes a way for it. Because you and I, we, we, our capacities are like tiny shriveled up raisins. That's the word picture. And, and we have big prayers to the Lord. We love to pray big prayers and the Lord adores 
restores our prayers. When I say, God, give me the fullness, like don't hold back all that you would give. And yet these tiny capacities Excuse me. <coughs> Do we have any moms in the room? Kids? Sick kids? It's their fault. <coughs> you, get, you get this. I'm fighting this sickness because of my kids because they passed it to me. Okay, compassion. So, <laughs> tiny, raisin-like capacities, right? And, and, we cry big prayers, and the Lord wants to answer those prayers. He wants to cause our capacity to expand so that he can actually give us himself. And so hunger, it's like the, the heart expander on the inside. It causes our hearts to have space so that he can come and, and answer that deep cry for him. It's truly a gift. I remember, <coughs> excuse me, I remember when I was 20 years old, you guys may have met my sister Deborah yesterday, right? Okay, we're four minutes apart. So we're sitting in a car together. I was 20, she was 20. And um, she's telling me about the vision that she has to go deep in the Lord. And she told you her story yesterday about when she was 19. Well, we had been, we had gone off to college and gone our separate ways, and here we are together, and like something had happened to her. I mean, she's got this fire in her eyes. And she's, she's telling me, I want to give myself to prayer and to fasting. And she's starting to talk to me about how that was going to look, and you know, the amount of hours of prayer she really wanted to give, and the amount of days she wanted to fast, and at first, I mean, I confess, I was listening to her going, what in the world are you talking about? Are you crazy? And, and I mean, coming from a sincere heart, I mean, we love Jesus, we knew Jesus our whole lives, awesome, awesome family, I mean, great, great story, but I'm looking at her going, fasting? What? And yet, I'll never forget the look in her eyes. <coughs> Excuse me. It was, so, it was filled with delight. She had so much fascination because God was beautiful and he wanted to be known. And he was like that great ocean. And he wanted us to go search him out, the deep things of his heart, the knowledge of God. And, it's so connected with me in that time to give myself to the place of prayer and fasting so that I could search out the deep, the beauty of the man Christ Jesus. And the Lord wants us to say yes to that. He wants to, to bring us into that place of searching out his beauty and, and he wants it to actually become part of our schedule, become part of our time and how we give ourselves to prayer and even fasting and working it out in the day-to-day -day so that we can know him. It turns out, Deborah was right. I mean, I think about that time when I was 20 and she's talking about the beauty of Jesus and how the Lord awakened my heart to, to go search him out and to know him. What I didn't know then for sure that I know for sure today is that he is beautiful, that he does satisfy, and that when we give ourselves to him, he causes the heart to burn like nothing else. And the Lord wants to invite us into that, searching him out and finding that beauty. Now let's look at the heart of fasting. Look at Matthew 9 with me. talked about the gift of fasting, so it's a gift because it expands our hearts to receive him. 
I want to talk about the heart of fasting, and I believe we find the heart of fasting in Matthew 9, 15, when Jesus brings these two things together. Now just imagine, there he is, the Word made flesh. He's a bridegroom. And, and when John the Baptist's disciples come to him and say, can the friends of the bridegroom mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast. John's disciples came and, and essentially said, why are we fasting and your disciples not fasting? And then Jesus answers with this declaration of who he is as the bridegroom. And, and he, he says this most interesting statement, and I believe it to be so, so valuable to us in our day. First of all, he's saying, I'm the bridegroom. Now, that is such a monumental statement. I mean, they're hearing, I, I'll never forget when it connected to me. When Jesus said those words there in Matthew 9, I mean, it was like light bulbs going on for the hearers. And it was like he was drawing all the way back through the whole story. From the very beginning, from Genesis 2, you know, as Paul, Paul reaches back from Ephesians 5 all the way to Genesis 2 and he's like, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. So Jesus, he's talking and, and it's like, when he says bridegroom, I mean, you're hearing Jeremiah, you're hearing Isaiah, you're hearing the prophets, of course, Hosea, who lived out and walked out that, uh, that reality of the bridegroom. And Jesus, there in the flesh, says, I'm the bridegroom. And in essence, he's stating, I am the Lord, and I've always been the bridegroom. Your maker is your husband. I remember you in the days of your youth when you ran after me in the wilderness and all of those statements that he made throughout the Old Testament, now he claims them in himself as he's standing there in the flesh. And here we are, eye to eye, face to face with the bridegroom himself. I'll never forget when that connected to me because it was like the whole story just came together from Genesis to Revelation. It was like the garden to the wedding, that man, the Word made flesh, he's a bridegroom, we're on our way to the great wedding supper of the Lamb. He gave his life in death as that offering, giving all for the sake of love to, to win back to himself a harlot bride, Jew and Gentile. And that bridegroom is the one that we will marry, the marriage supper of the Lamb. So at the heart of our fasting is the bridegroom, the Lord Jesus. When he tied his identity as bridegroom to the subject of fasting, he bound together the motivation of love with this voluntary weakness. He married the grace of fasting to the storyline that began in a garden and ends in a wedding, to who he is as the bridegroom and who we are as the bride. I t I'll tell you that changes everything. I mean, fasting before a bridegroom, it's a fast that's rooted in desire. It's rooted in love. It's like what I described that I saw in my sister's eyes. It was like, wait a second, I'm looking for like that grit your teeth self-denial thing when you're talking about fasting. That's not what I see. I see fascination. I see delight. I see desire. It's about beauty. Wait a second. Beloved, we will never give, never give ourselves to the Lord in abandonment unless we have seen the wholehearted givenness of our God to us. Our, our spiritual zeal comes and our spiritual intensity, it comes out of seeing his intensity, how much he has loved us. And when we see that, it's like an afterthought. To be wholehearted, are you kidding? Did you see what he did? Did you see who he is and where this is going? Heart, soul, mind, and strength, of course. He's beautiful, he's worthy. I give him everything. 
And that's the heart that the Lord wants to, us to have even in our fasting. So in Matthew 9, he described how in the, in the days when the bridegroom was taken away, between his first and second comings, fasting would take on the face of enhancing and sharpening love and longing in the lives of his friends. Jesus wants us to encounter him and experience him. There is an experiential part of knowing him and he longs that we would enter into that day by day by day until we see his face. He wants to strengthen our love for him, to strengthen our longing for his return. Another aspect of the bridegroom fast is we grow in yearning for that God-man to split the skies and to return. We begin to love his appearing because we love a real person and our hearts burn for the day when he makes all things right. Again, this is why fasting is such a gift because it causes our hearts and our, our affections to be centered upon him. It makes a way in our, in our inner man for that. This paradigm of fasting out of love for the bridegroom enlarges the heart through encountering God's beauty and affections. It's not a fast to achieve God's attention, but to experience the affections he already has for us. Again, we fast not to move his heart, but to move our own. Because, you know, it, it isn't something that we're trying to earn. We want to touch that all-consuming fire of his heart. And we're dull, and we don't know it. We're far, and we don't know it. And we want to be near. We want to, we want to enter in. We want to experience the love that he has for us. Sometimes we think about Jesus and we think, God, I just wish that I could know you more, but you never answer my prayers and you never come. And we have to know there is a process. We sign up to give ourselves to a lifestyle of prayer and fasting, to say yes to the ache of hunger, to posture our lives in that place. He does come to the hungry he fills, he satisfies the longing heart. We have to give ourselves to the waiting for him. So Jesus placed this exercise right at the center of love. Fasting fosters our fellowship with Jesus in this day that we live in, between his two comings. Until his return, we are given this gift as a catalyst to strengthen our love for him and our experience of his manifest love and presence. Nothing fuels our wholehearted love more than the experience of his love for us. You and I both, without even knowing you, I know this, you want more of Jesus. I want more of Jesus. Again, that man on that mount giving that sermon, he knew how to bring the human heart into abounding love. Sometimes we look at scripture like it's poetry, you know, just big words and great promises. And we just go, I mean, that's great language, but is it real? Yes. Yes, Jesus said, I came that you would have joy, that your joy would be made full. And the one who said that knew exactly how to make joy full. He knows how to make love abound. It's not poetry. It's real. And he wants us to give ourselves to the lifestyle that he prescribed so that we can enter into it, so that we can know him, so that we can grow in love, that our love would abound still more and more. Fasting is part of that. Let's look at the fight in fasting. The fight in fasting is because we are always in a battle of passions. And the Lord is after the passions of our heart. We stimulate and seek to satisfy our souls in a thousand ways other than by God. And the Lord wants our hearts 
to be caught up and riveted upon him. I remember when I was 20 and I was having, you know, this vision that I could love him with all my heart. And I remember driving in my car, you know, day in and day out. And I just pray this little prayer. I would pray, cause this heart to love you. Cause this heart to love you. And I, I had been wrecked by Ephesians 3, the height, the width, the length, the depth, that I would know and comprehend the love of Christ. And I was just like, I know there's more. And so I'd pray this little prayer, cause this heart to love you. And, and at that point in time, I, I just, I didn't know if, if he would. And I didn't even know what it would look like if he did. But I believed that it was available. I believed that I could actually be overtaken with love for the man Christ Jesus because of experiencing and knowing his love for me. So I prayed that prayer. And I remember just sometime this last year, I was, it was one of those mornings, again, the moms in this room will understand. It was one of those mornings where I'm trying to get four kids out the door, you know, and it's like 7 a.m. And it's cold outside. And so we've got, we've got to get up, pull warm bodies out of bed, and then get them dressed, and then get them fed, and then get lunches made, and then get coats on and gloves on and hats on, all without any fighting or arguing or chasing the dog. And why do we even have a dog? I don't know. It's my husband's fault. But I'm going, oh, this is crazy. And it's like, you know, 7.15. I had to be there by 7.15. I had to get four kids in their allotted places by 7.15. And I remember, you know, just like getting everybody in the car, shutting the door, spilling the coffee. And God bless my husband, you know, because I, I'd said yes to the dog, but he cleans up my coffee every day. I mean, you know, it's just part of what he does. It's part of his love for me. Cleans up my coffee because I spill it every day. But anyway, and so, so we're, we're in the car, and I mean, we're crazy. And, and we're, I, I'm, after I've been commando, you know, like, get your socks, get your hats, get your glove. Did you make your lunch? Stop bothering your sister. Okay, we're in the car, and I'm... And I'm, I'm, I remember I was, I was going to prayer lead with, with John Thurlow, a John Thurlow set. Now, if you don't know John Thurlow sets, you need to find out about John Thurlow sets. So I remember I, I slide into my seat to prayer lead with John that morning. And, and he starts singing that song about you're still the one I love. You're still the one I love. And I mean, from my gut, it was like instant sobbing. And I was like, oh, and I had this flashback. And I thought, I, I went all the way back to that little 20 year old praying that prayer, cause this heart to love you. And I went, oh, you did it. You did it. I didn't even know you were doing it, but God, you turned. You turned the affections of my heart toward yourself. You laid hold of them. I don't even know how to get my affections laid hold of, but you do, and you took hold of them, and now I can have a crazy morning, but I love you, and you did that, and only God can do that. And, and that's what the Lord, he desires to lay hold of our affections. Fasting, the, 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 the role that fasting plays is, guess what? It exposes that inner space. You know, we, we, we have this true reality. My, my husband and I joke through the years, you know, as, as we would be fasting and We'd come home on, on a day and we'd kind of just both be really crabby. You know how you are when you're fasting? <laughs> and it's like we would say, I mean, we used to say, sorry, babe, sorry, I'm fasting. You know, like fasting. Like blame it on the fasting, you know? And then it's like we finally figured out like, oh, no. This is the real me. 
I mean, that other person you know all the time is that one that's propped up by all the little extras that make me a little bit happier, but wow. This is the real, sorry, babe. It's me, you know? It's the, it's the person that Jesus sees every single moment. Wow. And that's what fasting does. I mean, it's like there are no props. Wow, this is the, this is the real me. And Jesus is looking at us going, uh-huh. That's who I see all the time. As the very person I see all the time, it unmasks the true state of our reality. But you know what else it does? That's semi-negative on the positive side. It, in that place of exposure, it's like he takes hold of our deepest affections and he says, I want that for myself. I'm gonna win you over. I, more than food, more than coffee, more than media, more than relationships, whatever. Everything else is second. I want that space. And he gets into that space if we let him. He conquers the human heart. He conquers it if we let him. There's something real called loving the Lord with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. That first commandment, it's real. By the Holy Spirit, he lays hold of the inner man. He conquers us. And so it's this gift that he gives us. And, and though there's a fight, there's such delight. I remember when it switched for me and I began to think of fasting as something that I liked. I mean, sort of, you know, not technically, but sort of. Because I knew, I knew about the tasting of Jesus. I knew about when everything else was pulled away and just that tenderness. There's this sweet tenderness happens in our hearts in those times of fasting. And yeah, we don't like not eating, and who likes being weak? Not a one of us. But that's the whole thing. I mean, he brings us near, and he perfects his strength right there in the midst of our weakness. I mean, I used to think, you know, if I grow in God, I am gonna just get stronger and stronger and stronger, you know? And I, 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 it's, it struck me through the years like, that's actually not true. Oh God, this is not what I thought. I thought I would feel stronger and stronger, but instead I feel weaker and weaker. And the Lord goes, you're getting it. Do, do you remember? I mean, don't forget who you're following. The lamb, the cross, I mean, that's who we're following. And, and our pride is so big, and he wants to conquer that pride with humility, the humility of Jesus. And fasting is such a key way that we say yes to that conquering. So Jesus wants to bring us to that place where we could maybe even say, yes, fasting is a gift, and say yes to the grace of it. I remember when I was, again, back in my early 20s, just, just in that new place of prayer and fasting, spending hours a day in prayer, fasting, you know, one or two days a week, and I mean, it was like not exactly what I expected, you know? I think some of us just, you know, we sign up, and, and it's awesome, and we have these great expectation of what it's gonna look like, and then wow, prayer can be hard and difficult and boring and long, and fasting is like way worse than that. And I remember this, this day that I, my, my friend and I, we, you know, we were kinda in this together, and looking back now, it's funny, but I was so sincere, but we kind of fasted like with banana milkshakes. That's just kind of the fast that we did. And so, so I remember, I just, I don't know why this is the picture, but I remember just setting my banana milkshake up on my dresser and I'm there alone in my room and I'm like, God, I'm wasting away here. I mean, it was like, this is ridiculous. This is, you have got to be kidding me that this is how I get to know you? Like, 
long hours of prayer when you don't talk and not eating. I, I don't even understand. I, have, I had friends calling me, you know, that they, they knew me from years past, and they're like, are you okay? Um, we're just a little bit concerned. You know, have you heard that before? We're concerned. You're alone. <laughs> You're fasting. I mean, you know, who knows? I, it probably looks like that. And the truth is, I remember those questions, and I remember thinking, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I'm putting all of my eggs in this one basket. I don't know if he's going to come. I don't know if this is nonsense and foolishness, but I think he said this is the way forward, and, and he said to go for it, and so I'm going for it. And I remember going to bed at the end of those days, so many days, and I had caught a vision. I had caught a vision for every prayer mattering to the Lord. And I would say at the end of those days, just with that mustard seed size faith, I would say, write it down, Lord. Write it down. It's for the book. And I would picture in my mind the great book that one day, the book of remembrance, that he would open up and he would say, do you remember this day and this prayer? And when you, you were so alone and you didn't have any friends, except for your sister, but she, you know, she was like, way on the other side of town and she was all by herself too and you know it was like and you just had this heart that just said oh just to help me God I want to know you I want to love you and I would picture that day when Jesus would say I wrote it all down I was taking you seriously you had no idea what I was doing in the deep inner workings of your heart but I was laying hold of your affections I tell you he really gives us himself. He really, I call it the great takeover of the human heart. The great takeover when he gets in to our inner life and he takes over our desires and, and, and we become set. Like David, one thing I desire, one thing. Like Mary of Bethany, we pour out everything and we're looking at that man going, are you kidding me? It's not waste. He's my future. He's everything. And he takes hold of that space and we begin to love him. And we would give everything for that man. It's, it's Paul the apostle saying, I'm a drink offering. I'm a bond servant. My life's not my own. I'm his. The Lord wants to do that in every single one of us. There's coming a day, it says in Ephesians 5, when he will present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. That's where it's going. It's going to the marriage supper of the Lamb. It's going to a bride made ready. But he wants to take us on a journey. And I just want to... I wanna specifically speak to 20 year olds and anyone in that window, go for it. Get a vision to know the Lord, to behold his beauty, to give yourself to becoming laid hold of in that space in your inner life. And don't evaluate for a long time because if you would have asked the 20 year old version of me, is it working? I probably would have said, I don't think so. It took years before I could look back with that perspective and go, absolutely. I call that time period the time period of digging a well. I dug a well. The Lord wants to, to beckon you to dig a well in the place of prayer and fasting in your 20s. Go for it. I had, I had a, a father and a mom and, and other spiritual fathers that instead of saying, calm down, they said, go for it. And I know I was immature and I had some wrong ideas, but oh, that, that we would be those that turn around to others and say, go for it. And oh, that the 20-year-olds would do it. 
You gotta do it in your 20s because when you, you know, it's just the story I just told. I didn't know, you know, I couldn't fast forward and know my life as a mom with four kids and all the craziness. Who knows what's ahead? But when you, you know, you cause that, that fire to begin to burn in your inner man, in your early years, it continues if you keep feeding that flame. It holds up, and, and there's that place that you draw from time after time in all the years to come. So again, I just wanna, I wanna encourage you, if the Lord put in that in your heart, go for it. The Lord wants to, over time, cause our affections to really change. They truly shift. That bridegroom God, he's jealous. He said it purposefully. I'm an all-consuming fire. Jealous is my name. And one of the qualities of God most revealed in the bridegroom identity is his jealousy. He wants all of us, not just a part. He wants every bit of us. And we don't know our interior life. We don't know, you know, the, the little hidden places that aren't responding. We don't have to know because the Holy Spirit searches and knows. All we have to do is every day say, yes, Jesus. There's no part in me that I know of that's resisting you. And oh God, shine your light. If you find anything, search me, oh God. See if there's any wicked way in me. Lead me, lead me in the way everlasting, and he will. The bridegroom God is jealous over us. He's jealous over our affections. He wants to cause our hearts to be fully and wholly given. That's his commitment to us. He also wants us to get a vision for imparting that beauty of Jesus to others. We've been talking a little bit about messengers of the, the beauty of the Lord. The Lord wants to you know, some of those 20 year olds that I just spoke to, ask the Lord, oh God, would you cause my eyes to be open, my ears to hear, my heart to be rent with the beauty of the Lord? And he will. He will cause our hearts to burn within us so that we can have a message of comfort. Do you know who he is? We'll be able to say, have you seen his beauty? Have you touched the potency of that man? And we will be able to cause other hearts to, to, to see and to behold the beauty of the Lord. He wants to do that in us. Let's all stand together. Ryan, you can come on up. Fasting isn't easy. No one's saying it's easy. We're addicted to things we don't know we're addicted to. There's inherent delays in fasting. There's a waiting. There's that place of not feeling what you thought you would feel. And just that, that pain and the ache. And it's that difficulty when the the spiritual state gets exposed when we go, oh no, this is who I really am. It's, it's not that it's easy, but again, the one who fashioned us for himself, he knew what he was doing. He knew what he was inviting us into when he said, this is the way forward. I will cause your heart to burn within you. I will give you the revelation of my beauty. I will cause you to love me with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. He knows our way forward, and that's why we say yes. We say yes until we see his face. Corporately, the Lord's going to bring that little groan. We have our individual groans. He's gonna bring it corporately into that great, deep, lovesick heart of the bride of Christ in Revelation 22, 17. The spirit and the bride say, come. That's where it's going. He takes little hearts, fills them with hunger, 
We say yes to that ache. We grow in longing for Jesus. We experience the exchange of knowing his love and loving him. He causes our passions to be centered upon him alone. And then together we become the people of God, the body of Christ, the bride of Christ that say, Jesus, come. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Amen. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. Let's just give our hearts to him now. I want to call specifically forward. If you're in that 20-year-old bracket and you felt your heart responding, if you would like prayer, if you want to come forward. And those of you that maybe, you know, you're hearing about the bridegroom today in a new way. You want to grow in that revelation. If you want to come forward. Anyone that would like prayer, that wants to respond, we want to pray for you. Jesus, cause our hearts to love you. Do, oh God, what's in your heart to do. When you lay hold of the human heart, and you win it over for yourself. It's your delight to do it. We give ourselves to you, Jesus. We say yes. We say yes to a life of prayer and fasting, giving. Oh God, you're the one we want. Give us grace, Jesus. Our bridegroom is 